by the late 1930s, we got this beauty. We got the Caroline Products decision, which contains in it footnote number four. And in case you're thinking, my gosh, this guy's some kind of freaking genius. He knows a footnote from a Supreme Court case. But footnote four of the Caroline Products case is so well known, it's simply referred to as footnote four. <laughs> footnote four says that everything the federal government does is presumed to be constitutional. <laughs> Which seems like an awful lot of weight for one footnote to bear, right? <laughs> And now I'll get back to that in a minute, because it does, it does then later go on to say, well, you know, okay, you could find something unconstitutional, but here are the hoops you have to jump through to prove that. I'll get back to that in a minute, but it just goes to show that all these attempts to limit the power of government have just been effortlessly brushed aside. Now, Jefferson thought, ultimately, that it was the people whose responsibility it is to uphold the Constitution. But, you know, I read not long ago a headline that said, over half of Americans are on the dole in one form or another. Over half of Americans are get, getting some kind of goodies. So if you say to them, hey, we need, to, we need to have a limited government, you know, under the Constitution, they'll just say, you know, take a hike, pal. I want my, my loot. So even the people become corrupted. So who's going to enforce the thing? It seems like it just can't be done. So one thing that we, one of the points we focus on and that I focus on in some of my writing is, uh, the hilarious jurisprudence of the Commerce Clause. Now, there's a clause in the Constitution about regulating interstate commerce, commerce going from one state to another. Now, James Madison said that this clause is not really intended to give the federal government a positive power. It's really a negative power. That is, the, it, it, it empowers the federal government to strike things down that inhibit the freedom of commerce, barriers to commerce, obstacles, for example, tariffs that one state might erect against other states' products, that sort of thing. But by the early 19th century, with the evil John Marshall, uh, John Marshall is Chief Justice of the United States from 1801 to 1835, who is falsely held up as a hero by many libertarians. He's a scoundrel, he's a disgusting human being who should be respected by nobody. But that's a whole other matter, we'll talk about that later. But John Marshall began to argue that no, 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 actually the Commerce Clause is far more expansive than we dreamed. That in fact the Commerce Clause can authorize the federal government to regulate anything that takes place in a state that might have an effect on another state. Well, you know, as Jefferson said, look, in, in some fundamental, you know, looking at, at things, you know, subspecia eternitatis, everything affects everything else. So this, in effect, is giving us an unlimited government. And that's, in fact, what's happened. Now, in the 20th century, that was changed so that now it has to have a substantial effect on another state, and then they can regulate it. But... Well, take, for example, this is my favorite example. Many of you have probably heard of this case. In 1942, we got this Wickard versus Filburn Supreme Court case involving a farmer who had grown wheat for his own use to consume or to feed to his livestock on his own farm. And the federal government was trying to regulate how much he was allowed to grow. And he said, well, you know, forget that. How can you regulate that? I mean, this is not interstate commerce. I mean, it's not even moving it's not even inter-property commerce. It's right here on my <laughs> land. How could you possibly regulate it? I'm, I'm growing it. I'm consuming it. And the answer was that because you're growing your own wheat, that means you're not purchasing wheat in the interstate market. So by abstaining from purchasing wheat in the interstate market, you are implicitly engaged in interstate commerce and thereby subject to regulation. <laughs> So there goes Madison's, oh, this don't worry about this clause, doesn't really mean much, you know, don't anybody worry. So this, after that, after early 1940s, for the next half century, the Supreme Court did not once challenge the other branches of the federal government on their interpretations of the Commerce Clause. Not one time. They let the federal government get away with all kinds of crazy things on the ground that interstate commerce somehow authorized it. Well, that stopped in 1995. We got this Lopez, U.S. versus Lopez case. In that case, that involved a, a law involving gun-free school zones. Now, there were already 40 states that had gun-free school zone laws, so this seemed to have been pretty well in hand, but the federal government was arguing that it had the right to go and regulate guns in and around schools, and it doesn't matter if you think that's a good idea or not. The point is, is it 
authorized by the Constitution to, to do this, which would seem to be a state matter. The argument they used, though, to justify it was based on the Commerce Clause. And it went as follows, that if students are afraid that there might be guns in or around their schools, they won't be able to learn as effectively. And if they don't learn as effectively, they're going to wind up ignorant. And if they're ignorant, they won't be as productive, and therefore not as many goods will be produced, and therefore interstate commerce will be lessened. <laughs> and so the Supreme Court, which is normally pretty indulgent on these things, said that that's a bit much even for us, <laughs> and struck that down. <laughs> but a lot of people looked at this, and a lot of people who still sort of cling to the idea that we can limit government, they said, aha! Finally, 53 years later, the Supreme Court sees the light. But in fact, if you look closely at the case, they don't actually question the substantial effects doctrine. Their argument was, that does not substantially affect interstate commerce. But they still kept that rule, that if it does, then we can, then we can regulate it. So people started to think this is a new birth of limited government. It was no such thing. Ten years later, and, and, this, and I don't need to just take a case from ten years later, but this is a, a well-known case. There was the medical marijuana case involving uh, Angel Rach. Now, uh, again, a lot of times when you talk about medical marijuana with libertarians, argue, they get impatient with this and they say, this is such a small issue, you know, why don't we focus more on generally, you know, general legalization questions. But I focus on this because the legal arguments here are so revealing about the nature of the U.S. government that I cannot uh, restrain myself from examining it. In the Rach case, you have a woman, actually, initially it was two women. Um, this is a case that made its way through two lower courts and then to the Supreme Court. In the two lower courts, it actually involved a, a couple of women, and then ultimately it only involved Angel Rach. But these were women who had one condition or another that could be alleviated only by the medicinal use of cannabis. And she, and Angel Rach, you know, grew her own plant, or, or had people grow plants and then give, give the stuff to her, or um, Diane Monson grew them herself, and whatever. And California had a special law, uh, the Compassionate Use Act of 1996, that authorized this in cases like this. And if you were to look at all the things wrong with Angel Rach, it, it would just blow your mind. That, I mean, this was, I mean, she had everything you can imagine, in, in, including inoperable tumors. She had a mysterious wasting syndrome that caused her to lose at least a pound a day. So, I mean, she would just waste away. She, could, she couldn't walk. She had, I mean, I, I can't even list them all. I mean, we list them in the, in the book, but it's unbelievable what this woman went through. And she was told, you know, well, you know you're going to jail. We can't, uh, you, you can't do that. So the thing finally went to the Supreme Court. Now, it's worth noting that all the so-called liberals on the court, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Stephen Breyer, you know, liberals, they believe in individual liberty, right? You know, and conservatives want to force the Bible on everybody. That's the caricature, you know? Well, in fact, no, Stephen Breyer was all in favor of, uh, of criminalizing this. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, oh, well, always, federal government supremacy trumps all other values at all times for liberals on the court. It, it seems to, be, to, to me to be the case. The, the one person who actually took a really principled stand was actually Clarence Thomas, who said that the whole substantial effects test is totally bogus. It's got no history in the, in, the, in the Constitution or anything like that. But what's interesting was that Angel Rach was arguing that her rights were being violated by the federal government. And now she's got to reckon with Caroline Products, that the federal government is assumed to be right. So she's got to look at footnote four and see, well, how do I show that nevertheless, even though you're assumed to be right, you're, you're actually wrong? Like, how do I even argue that? And the Caroline Products decision, footnote four, says that the only way you can prove your case against the federal government is if the right you are alleging has been violated is a, quote, fundamental right. Well, well, you know, fundamental, what's that? Well, the government's going to get to decide that. In later cases, it's, it was later explained to us what a fundamental right is. A fundamental right is one that satisfies two conditions. It must be deeply rooted in this nation's history and traditions. And secondly, it must be implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. So, okay, so they take a completely amorphous, impossible to understand requirement, and then they just add another one. <laughs> so Angel Rach went into court on, and, and basically made the argument that she is trying to preserve her life and avoid unnecessary pain and suffering. And she says, that seems to me to be deeply rooted in this country's history and traditions, and that seems to be 
you know, have something to do with ordered liberty. <laughs> but here's the problem. What if the court defines the right in question differently? What if the court says, no, we say that the right you're claiming is the right to use marijuana for medical reasons. Now, does that sound like it's deeply rooted in American history and traditions? Does that sound like it is as deeply rooted in ordered liberty? So the problem is now the court can stack the deck against you simply by deciding how it wants to define the right that you're claiming has been violated. So in fact, she walks in there and the court, you know, listens patiently and then the decision comes down that uh, yes, we understand. They actually say we, we believe the testimony of her physician, that this is the only treatment that will be satisfactory in this case, that everything else that's been tried has had side effects that are even worse. This is the only option she has. We recognize that. But the real right that she's claiming, they said, is the right to smoke marijuana for medical reasons. So we're going to restate her claim that way and then rule. Well, how do you think they ruled? Sorry, you can't do it. In fact, Here's how the case actually reads. Federal law does not recognize a fundamental right to use medical marijuana prescribed by a licensed, licensed physician to alleviate excruciating pain and human suffering. <laughs> Look, they said it, not me, all right? It's not like these Supreme Court justices, you know, just drop from the sky onto the bench. Who put them there? The other two, two crummy branches, right? 